Nine-year-old Aisha Degree was born and raised in Shelby, North Carolina in August of 1990. Shelby is a small suburb of Charlotte, sitting to the west of the larger city. Aisha turned nine in the year 2000, and as of that year, Shelby had a population of just under 20,000. Aisha was described by friends and family as being a bright, shy, and sweet girl. Her family brought her up in a sheltered home, with Aisha and her brother O'Brien being raised in a situation which limited exposure to outside influences. Besides school and church, Aisha had very little interaction with people outside of her own family. Her parents, Harold and Aquila, both worked, and when they couldn't be home in time to take care of the children, they either stayed with their aunt and grandmother just down the street from their own home, or looked after each other. Both children had keys to the family home, and were able to let themselves in and out as necessary. In February of 2000, the weekend preceding the next Monday's Valentine's Day, Aisha had a full weekend. There was no school on Friday, and so she and her brother stayed with their aunt Alicia, who took them to practice for their basketball teams that evening. On Saturday, both Aisha and O'Brien played for their respective teams. Aisha's team lost that night, and Aisha reportedly took it hard, blaming herself for fouling out and costing the team the win. It was her team's first loss that season, and everyone referred to Aisha as the star player. Although Aisha was saddened by the loss, she seemed to rebound quickly, and by the end of the evening was back to her normal jovial self. The next day, on Sunday, the family went to church together, and it appeared as if all was typical for the Degree family. That afternoon, Aisha's father left to work second shift at his second job, and would be gone until midnight. Aquila's normal routine for the children was interrupted when a car accident in the area knocked out the power. Unable to bathe the children that night, Aquila put them to bed at their normal time of 8 p.m. Sometime between 8 p.m. and 4 a.m., Aisha would vanish. It was a cold, stormy night in Shelby. It was just over freezing at 34 degrees with heavy winds and torrential rain. By the time Harold returned home that night, the household was sleeping soundly despite the tempest raging outside. He checked on Aisha and her brother and found them sleeping peacefully. Harold went to bed around 2.30 a.m., but before he did, he checked on the children once more and all seemed well. O'Brien heard his sister moving around in her bed sometime after this, but assumed she was simply turning over and didn't check to see beyond that. He fell back asleep and thought nothing else about it. At 6.30 a.m. on Valentine's Day, Monday, February 14, 2000, Aquila came to the children's room to wake them for their baths and to get ready for school. Upon entering the room, she discovered that Aisha was not there. She searched the house, and as panic began to set in, she woke Harold and O'Brien to help find her. Phone calls to the children's aunt and grandmother produced no sightings of Aisha, and so they promptly called the police, who arrived with canine units in tow. Unfortunately, the dogs were unable to pick up on Aisha's scent, likely due to the storm, and so a foot search was initiated. The first day of searching would prove fruitless. The media became involved and splashed Aisha's photo all over the television and newspapers. This exposure brought several witnesses forward who had an odd story to tell. That Monday morning, between the hours of 3.45 and 4.15 a.m., several drivers along Shelby's Rural Highway 18 saw a child fitting Aisha's description walking south along the side of the road. Despite the weather, she was wearing no winter coat, but didn't appear to be in distress. When one driver attempted to offer assistance, Aisha fled into the woods. This would be the last confirmed sighting of Aisha Degree. Over the weeks, months, and years after this sighting, several mysterious clues would come to the surface and many theories about what happened to Aisha would be purported. In a fascinating turn of events, police determined that not only did Aisha leave her home that night of her own volition, but she planned it for at least a day or two prior to going. The question became, why did Aisha, a girl afraid of storms and the dark, leave her warm bed during a freezing storm in the darkest hours of the morning? And where was she going? The discovery of some personal items pushes investigators to shift the focus of their search, and a year and a half later, 
Aisha's backpack is discovered in an unsettling condition. While the police believe Aisha left on her own, others think that she was taken or tricked into leaving her house that night, perhaps by a member of her own inner circle. Police state that foul play is certainly involved and that they have several leads on possible suspects, but nothing comes from this. Was Aisha manipulated by her abductor into leaving her home that night? Did she simply run away, inspired by something she read, and only ran into foul play later that morning? Did a known pedophile and murderer in the area play a role in her disappearance? Or was Aisha Degree the victim of a hit and run? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 11, The Vanishing of Aisha Degree. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today's episode focuses on the frustrating and tragic disappearance of nine-year-old Aisha Degree. Before we move into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on missing persons and unsolved murders. We are available across multiple platforms, and we are on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, and many more. I've recently launched a Patreon for those of you who wish to support the podcast. It can be found at patreon.com slash trace evidence. This podcast is a complete one-man operation, so if you enjoy it and wish to help support it, please check out the Patreon. Also, stay tuned at the end of this episode for shoutouts to this month's Patreon supporters. Links, information, and more items including YouTube videos and full episode transcripts can be found on our official website at trace-evidence.com. If you'd like to contact me, you can email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com, tweet me at traceevpod, that's T-R-A-C-E-E-V-P-O-D, or join the Facebook discussion group simply by searching for Trace Evidence Podcast, or by clicking the direct link on our website. If you have questions, comments, or case suggestions, I'd love to hear from you. The show is approaching 100,000 downloads and I'm doing a special Q&A to celebrate the milestone. If you'd like your question included, contact me on Facebook, Twitter, or by email with your question, name, and location. If you enjoy the show, please rate and review us on whatever app or platform you're listening on, especially iTunes. The more ratings and reviews we get, the easier it becomes to find the podcast, and the more attention can be given to these cases. Today, we look at the mysterious disappearance of Asia Degree. This is a case that's been on my list for a while now, but was recently suggested by a member of the Facebook group, so thanks to Lana Greenland for giving me the extra push. This case is extremely tragic and frustrating. For what little information exists, there appear to be no easy answers. I personally live about 40 minutes from where she vanished, and to this day, it's still on people's mind and still hotly debated. This is the vanishing of Asia Degree. Aisha Degree was born on August 5, 1990, in Shelby, North Carolina. Her parents, Harold and Iquilla Degree, were married two years earlier on Valentine's Day of 1988. Aisha had a brother named O'Brien, and the two were raised in an apartment in a subdivision in North Shelby. According to all reports, Aisha was subjected to a very sheltered upbringing. Aisha's parents kept their children's social activity fairly limited, outside of school, church, and of course family. The children weren't allowed to watch a great deal of television, and were especially steered clear of the news, as their parents found it to be full of negativity and sad stories. The family did not own a computer either. In a 2013 interview with Jet Magazine, Iquilla stated, quote, Every time you turned on the TV, there was some pedophile who had lured somebody's child away via the internet, end quote. By February of 2000, Aisha was nine years old and a student in the fourth grade at Falston Elementary School. She had been described by many as being a timid girl who was polite but may have been intimidated by social situations. Aisha was four foot six inches tall, weighing approximately 60 pounds, an African American girl with brown eyes and black hair, which she usually styled in pigtails. Aisha's mother described her as cautious, shy, and content to stay within the limits they had set for her and her brother. Falston Elementary School was closed on Friday, 
February 11th. A lot of newspapers and websites report this closure as being for President's Day, but in 2000, President's Day fell on February 21st. Likely school was closed for a teacher workday, which would explain why there would be basketball practice later that night. If it had been closed for a holiday, usually after school activities would be canceled. While Alicia's parents were at work, she and her brother spent most of their time at their aunt Alicia's house, which was in the same neighborhood and just down the street from the family home. Due to their parents' work schedules, both Aisha and her brother had keys to the house so they could let themselves in after school, and their parents entrusted them to look after one another until one of their parents could arrive home from work. On Friday, February 11th, their aunt Alicia would take both children to practice for their youth basketball teams. On Saturday, February 12th, both Aisha and her brother had basketball games to play at Burns Middle School. Aisha's was first. Aisha played point guard and has been described by many as being the star player on the team. Unfortunately, Aisha would be fouled out during the game, and her team would go on to receive its first loss of the season. Aisha's parents have stated that Aisha was visibly upset about her performance in the game, and that she and her teammates cried following the loss. Aisha is also reported to have complained about injuring her leg during the game. Aisha's mother consoled her and told her that her leg would be fine. It's thought that Aisha felt responsible for the loss and took it to heart, but her parents say that her brother's game was next and by the end of it, Aisha seemed to have nicely rebounded and her spirits were back up. She was seen later that night joking, laughing, and playing with her friends and teammates. Following the completion of O'Brien's game, the family returned home for the night. The next day, on Sunday, February 13th, the family woke and Aisha and her brother went to their Aunt Alicia's house, from which they attended services at Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church in Waco, North Carolina. Following church, the kids had lunch at Alicia's home and were given Valentine's Day candy by their grandmother Joanne. Aisha was said to be in very good spirits and was excited and happy to receive the candy from her grandmother. Aisha's father, Harold, had to work his second job that evening. He would be working at PPG Industries until approximately midnight. Aisha and her brother returned home with their mother. Aisha laid around on the couch for a while before changing into her nightgown around 8 p.m. when both children went to bed. Aisha shared a bedroom with her brother O'Brien. A storm was rolling in that night, and a car accident occurred which knocked power out to the neighborhood. The power was restored by the time Harold arrived home at approximately 12.30 a.m. on what was now Monday, February 14th, Harold and Iquilla's anniversary and the day in which Aisha would vanish. Upon returning home, Harold says that he went to their bedroom and checked on the kids. Both children were reported to have been home and asleep in bed at 12.30 a.m. For the next two hours, details are a little sketchy. Some reports say that Harold watches TV as he usually does when he arrives home late at night and goes to bed around 2.30. Others report that after arriving home, Harold goes back out to pick up Valentine's Day candy and returns later, but again goes to bed around 2.30 a.m. Regardless of which account is accurate, at approximately 2.30 a.m., Harold checks on the children again and both are asleep in their beds. At this point, Harold goes to bed for the night. Sometime shortly after this, O'Brien reports hearing Aisha move around. He wakes up and sees Aisha standing in the bedroom. She's wearing her nightgown, white with red trim depicting a teddy bear on the front of it. According to O'Brien, she goes to the bathroom and returns shortly thereafter. Sometime later, O'Brien hears Aisha's bed springs squeaking and believes his sister is moving around in bed, but he doesn't look and falls back to sleep without noticing anything out of the ordinary. Aquila awakes at approximately 5.45 a.m. on Monday, February 14th. This is a slightly debated topic, as some have reported she woke up as late as 6.15 a.m. In her Jet Magazine interview, Aquila stated the time is 5.45, so that's the account I will go with. This was not a typical morning for the family, as it was both Valentine's Day as well as Aquila and Harold's wedding anniversary. In addition to these goings on for the day, the power outage the previous night had prevented the children from being able to take their baths before bed, so Aquila plans to have them clean up that morning. This supports the idea of Aquila waking up earlier than usual. Interestingly, most reports state that the power was knocked out around 9 p.m. from the aforementioned car accident, but I've also seen news accounts that the power could have gone out as early as 6 p.m. 
This would seem more accurate since the children were in bed by 8 p.m. and a 9 p.m. power outage wouldn't have affected their nightly routine. Normally, Aquila would wake the children around 6.45 a.m. to start their day and get them ready for school, but due to the need to bathe, she goes to their bedroom to wake them up a little earlier at approximately 6.30. When Aquila enters the bedroom, she finds O'Brien asleep in his bed, but Aisha's bed is empty. Not immediately panicked, Aquila begins looking around the house, assuming Aisha has woken up early and is somewhere in the house. At this point, Aquila begins to get scared and wakes Harold. Harold places a call to Alicia and his mother, the children's grandmother, who live down the street, asking if Aisha happened to be with them. Both Alicia and Joanne say they haven't seen Aisha since the previous day. Aquila hears a car at this point and, quote, that's when I went into panic mode. I put shoes on and ran outside, end quote. While outside, Aquila checks both of their vehicles, but again, Aisha is nowhere to be found. At this point, Aquila places a call to her mother, panicked, and trying to explain that Aisha is missing. Her mother tries to calm her down and tells her to hang up and immediately call the police. By 6.40 a.m., less than 10 minutes after Aquila noticed her daughter is missing, police are on the scene. Police arrived and had brought search dogs with them. Unfortunately, the dogs were unable to pick up on Aisha's scent. It's thought that the heavy rainstorm from the night before has made it difficult for the dogs to pick up and track her. I did some research regarding the, how the weather affects the abilities of tracking dogs. According to several owners and trainers of tracking dogs, rain does not necessarily eliminate a scent, but a combination of torrential weather will. Cold weather makes the scent fall, while warm weather makes it rise. Rain will actually refresh the scent, Absorbing the particles as the dog breathes the wet scent into its wet nose, it magnifies the scent with a taste. One particular website referred to this occurrence as similar to when a person chews a flavorful piece of gum. This doesn't make it more difficult to catch, but rain combined with heavy winds, such as occurred on the night Aisha vanished, will tend to scatter the scent. The dogs may be able to get a hit, but then they will have to follow each new trail caused by the wind's movements. While the police were investigating the home and using the dogs to try and pick up on Aisha, Harold, Aquila, and O'Brien were walking around the neighborhood, banging on doors and calling out for Aisha. By 7 a.m., many of the neighbors were awake, and some of them joined in the search. Throughout the course of the day, more friends, family members, and clergy would appear to comfort, support, and assist the family in any way that they could. Police find no signs of forced entry at the home, and all of the doors were still locked. The family and police spent this Valentine's Day searching for Aisha. They began close to the home and eventually began to spread out, circling further and further out from there. Following the first day's search, not much information is discovered and there are no sightings of Aisha. A mitten was found, which police believe could have belonged to Aisha, but Aquila later stated that the glove was not her daughter's and there were no winter clothing missing from the house. Investigators discover that Aisha's backpack is missing along with several items of her clothing. This, coupled with the fact that no one else appeared to have entered the home that night, leads police to theorize that Aisha has chosen to leave the house on her own and has locked the door behind her. Not only do police believe that Aisha made the choice to leave, but they go so far as to theorize that this was not a random occurrence. Based on things O'Brien heard that night and the items confirmed to be missing, they don't believe Aisha made a spur-of-the-moment decision packing her bag and leaving in the early morning hours. They believe that Aisha packed her bag ahead of time, possibly in the days before her disappearance, and planned to go at this particular time for reasons which remain the focus of a great deal of speculation. Aisha's parents find this hard to believe, as they can think of no reason for her to go, and due to the sheltered upbringing, she wasn't the type of girl to go out on her own. It's also mentioned that Aisha is deathly afraid of dogs and typically wouldn't go out by herself, by the evening of her first day missing, the media grabs a hold of the story, and both police, Aisha's family, as well as Aisha's photo are splashed all over the television. Aquila appeals through the media, stating, quote, She's my baby. Just bring her back. If somebody took her, or if somebody has seen her, just bring her back. End quote. As a result of these reports, several witnesses come forward who believe they may have seen Aisha in the early morning hours of February 14th. Two witnesses contact police saying they saw a girl fitting Aisha's description that morning walking down Highway 18. 
Highway 18 is a two-lane rural road that runs a total of 145 miles north and south. This was also the route taken by Aisha's school bus, and she may have had familiarity with where it would take her if she traveled along it. I've been on Highway 18 many times, and depending on where you live, you may have a very different picture in mind. In North Carolina, as well as many other southern states, these kinds of rural roads are majorly traveled, but very poorly lit, if lit at all. There are not lights dotting along the shoulder of the road, and at night, and during the early morning hours, they are extremely dark and can be difficult to navigate, especially in bad weather. According to two separate witnesses, one a truck driver, they each see Asia walking south alongside Highway 18 between 3.30am and 4.15am. Asia lives a few miles north of the main stretch of Shelby, and it's been theorized that she was heading into town as Highway 18 runs through Shelby. As previously mentioned, there was a storm that night. It was raining and very windy. It was a cold February in North Carolina, and both drivers were concerned. According to them, Asia was wearing a backpack and a long sleeve white t-shirt. Police confirmed the sightings based on their descriptions of Asia and the clothing that she was wearing matching items noted as being missing from the home. Cleveland County Sheriff Dan Crawford tells the media, quote, one sun-dropped truck driver and another motorist have called since they saw that she was missing on television and told officers that they saw a girl walking on the road about that time. We're pretty sure it was her because of the descriptions they gave are consistent with what we know she was wearing. End quote. If the descriptions are accurate, Asia was certainly not wearing clothing appropriate for the rainy, windy winter storm. According to reports at the time, the only items missing from the home were a pair of sneakers, a pair of pants, a pocketbook bearing the image of Tweety Bird, and Aisha's backpack. One driver tells police that upon spotting the girl, he went slightly past her and executed a U-turn to see if something was wrong or if she needed help. The rain and wind were so bad that the driver has to turn around two more times before he spots her again. At this point, he pulls over and calls out to the girl, but she seems spooked and runs down the hill from Highway 18, disappearing into a nearby woods. It should be noted Many news sites and blogs have referred to this as a thick woods or forest, but that doesn't appear to be the case. Though North Carolina does have some densely forested areas, this is not one of them. It was more or less the kind of tree line you see alongside a rural road, a thicket of trees but not so much a woods or a forest. This sighting of Asia was approximately 1.3 miles south of her home near the junction of Highway 18 and Highway 180. This is the last confirmed sighting of Asia Degree. For two long days of searching, no sign or trace of Asia is found. Finally, February 17th, the third day of the search, investigators pick up on Asia's trail. Along Highway 18, just 100 yards off the road west from the spot where Asia was sighted by the passing drivers, there's a shed used by Turner's Upholstery. The shed is located down a long dirt driveway and was filled with furniture and random items for the business, including a large tractor. Debbie Turner, owner of the business, discovered some items near the entrance to the shed on Tuesday, February 15th, less than 36 hours after Asia had vanished. Initially, she didn't make the connection to the missing child, but when investigators arrived on Thursday, the 17th, and asked for permission to search her property, she remembered the items and told the police about them. According to investigators, the items discovered were a green marker, a pencil, and a Mickey Mouse hair bow. The items were reported to have been discovered just inside the doorway of the shed. Immediately, police begin scouring the area, searching for traces of Asia. In addition to the items discovered by Debbie Turner, police find several candy wrappers. These wrappers are linked to Asia by several members of her basketball team who identify them as being included in small Valentine's gift bags they were given following the game on the previous Saturday night. In addition to the candy wrappers found at the shed, investigators discovered several more along the stretch of Highway 18 where the drivers had witnessed Asia walking the morning she disappeared. Search dogs were brought in again, but again were unable to detect Asia's scent. Some have suggested that Asia entered the shed in order to take shelter from the storm, while others have contended that she was taken into the shed against her will. Though neither claim can be substantiated, police did not find any signs of a struggle nor any physical evidence outside of the items left behind. It does raise the question, though, of why Aisha removed these items from her bag or pockets in the first place. 
Others, over the years, have questioned law enforcement's search efforts, wondering why it took them three days to initiate a search of a property located so close to the spot where Aisha was last sighted. Despite the efforts of investigators, and an increased focus on this particular area near Turner's upholstery, no further signs of Aisha were found. Finally, a week after Aisha's disappearance, the foot search was called off. 9,000 man-hours were used during the course of this week, and they came away with very little in terms of finding Aisha. In regard to the termination of the foot search, Sheriff Dan Crawford would state, quote, We have never really had that first good substantial lead. It's very frustrating to spend a lot of time and resources in an investigation and not have that good substantial lead come to you. End quote. Investigators and experts are baffled by the case and can't begin to understand exactly what happened. Though they theorize that Aisha left home of her own volition, many people debate this. Ben Ermini, director of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, was quoted as saying, quote, Kids usually don't start running away until the age of 12. Quote, John Goad, director of the North Carolina Center for Missing Persons, added, quote, She doesn't fit any standard profile of a missing child. I don't think a case like hers has ever happened anywhere, anytime, end quote. The theory put forward by police suggests that though Aisha left her home by her own choice, she likely ran into someone with darker intentions and became the victim of foul play. Law enforcement described this situation as difficult to track because often kidnappers and murderers track or stalk their victims first and there are clues to be found. If Aisha happened to stumble upon a would-be abductor, there would be few signs to indicate this. If it was indeed a situation of happenstance and a spur-of-the-moment action, there isn't much of a lead to follow. In March of 2000, with investigators frustrated and leads quickly drying up, they turned to the parents. Although they've publicly stated that they did not consider Harold nor Aquila to be suspects, they did ask for them to submit to a polygraph test. I was unable to locate any information related to Aquila, but in terms of Harold, he passed his polygraph test. Local law enforcement was soon joined by investigators from the FBI, as well as members of the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation. Sheriff Dan Crawford took center stage at a press conference and issued several statements regarding the investigation. In regard to the possibility of foul play, Crawford said, quote, Investigators have reason to believe that there may be individuals who have information pertinent to this investigation that for some unknown reasons have yet to come forward with said information. There is a strong belief that foul play is involved in Asia Degree's disappearance. End quote. When asked about possible suspects, Crawford replied, quote, There are active leads involving individuals that we are pursuing. End quote. Crawford said that the FBI had tried to draw up a profile of a possible suspect, but that there was not enough evidence to do this. The Department of Justice sent Kimberly Poyer, a child interview specialist, to interview friends of Asia to see if she might be able to discern any information from them. According to Poyer, quote, This is not therapy. I follow a standard protocol. Children can become very critical in cases like these. End quote. Over the course of the next few months, the Degree family would make several public pleas in the media. They appeared on the Montel Williams show. America's Most Wanted, as well as The Oprah Winfrey Show, aired segments covering the case. Despite the coverage, nothing more came to light. Investigators continued working the case, receiving daily tips, but none of them led to Asia or any sign or indication of where she could be. Eighteen months would pass from the time of Asia's disappearance before anything new would be found. On August 3rd, 2001, the first new piece of evidence in the case since her items were found in the Turner upholstery shed would surface. Approximately 26 miles north from the shed, along Highway 18, Aisha's backpack was discovered. It should be noted that Aisha was last seen traveling south, about a mile from her home, so it's incredibly unlikely that she brought the backpack 26 miles in the opposite direction. Terry Fleming a 44-year-old Burke County contractor was clearing a lot in the Laurel Fork area to make way for the construction of a house. While operating a grader, Terry uncovered what appeared to be a black garbage or lawn and leaf bag with an item inside. Curious, Terry stopped the grader and examined the bag. Inside of the garbage bag was another garbage bag, and inside of that bag was a backpack. The exact location of the bag is somewhat debated, but appears to have been approximately 50 yards off the shoulder of Highway 18. 
also located in the area were a pair of men's khaki pants and some scattered animal bones. According to several reports, Fleming opened the backpack and found a paper with Aisha's name on it, along with a phone number. Fleming was unfamiliar with Aisha's case, but felt uneasy about the bag itself. He reportedly wrote down the name and number. It wasn't until the next morning, sitting at breakfast with his wife, when he informed her of what he had found. According to some reports, his wife was aware of Aisha's case, and the two immediately called the police. Search and rescue teams were called in, and they combed the area looking for any signs of Aisha, but outside of the backpack, none were found. The FBI took the bag into their possession for forensic testing. It's important to note here that the FBI have never released the results of their testing and have never given a full list of the items found inside the bag. Many websites make claims about clothing, including Aisha's basketball uniform and photos of her family being found in the bag, but I can find no official statement or law enforcement issued press release which details the contents of the bag. To the best of my knowledge, and according to the Charlie Project listing for Asia Degree, all reports about the contents of the bag are in fact unconfirmed. Following the discovery of her bag, police considered this confirmation that foul play was involved in Asia's disappearance. It is their belief that the abductor or abductors of Asia took the bag into the woods and buried it where it was found. Discovery of the bag raises all kinds of other questions though and opens the door to a great deal of speculation regarding Aisha's disappearance. If indeed she were abducted, why would her bag essentially be preserved by placing it inside of trash bags and burying it, whereas if someone wanted to conceal it, they could easily have burned the bag, discarded it in a junkyard, or even thrown it off one of the many cliffs and mountainsides in the area where it was much less likely to be discovered? The answers to these questions have never been found, and the discovery of her backpack is the last piece of evidence that has ever been found in the disappearance of Aisha Degree. Over the next few years, Aisha's case began to grow cold. Investigators state that they continued to receive tips in regard to her possible location, or sadly, the possible location of her remains, but all of these tips led to dead ends. One particular tip came in 2004, and although the contents of the tip itself were unknown, there must have been enough involved that police took it very seriously. The tip is reported to have come from an inmate in the county jail. At the intersection of Shelby and Rube Spangler Roads in Lawndale, South Carolina, police initiated an excavation to retrieve possible human remains. Ultimately, the dig had no results, finding only animal bones and no evidence related to Asia Degree. In February of 2015, the FBI announced that a joint team of FBI agents Cleveland County Sheriff's Office investigators and State Bureau of Investigation agents were re-examining the case and interviewing witnesses again. They put up a $25,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of any individuals involved in or responsible for the disappearance of Asia Degree. Funds raised locally offered an additional $20,000, bringing the total to $45,000. Shelley Lynch, public affairs specialist with the Charlotte Office of the FBI stated, quote, we are going every aspect of this case and re-interviewing people. We are making sure there is no evidence that could still be tested. This is a case we have been actively working on for 15 years." End quote. Despite the reinvestigation, outside of the offer of a reward, nothing new would come from the second look at the case. Or perhaps something would. It's somewhat of a topic of debate, but in May of 2016, Investigators released their first new evidence in the case since the discovery of her backpack some 15 years earlier. The FBI released a statement that a new piece of evidence was unearthed wherein a witness claimed to have seen a girl, fitting Aisha's description, getting into a dark green car on Highway 18 near the site where she was last seen. The car is believed to be a late 70s Ford Thunderbird or Lincoln Mark IV. Both vehicles are very similar in style and size although the Lincoln Mark IV has a distinctive tire-shaped bump on the trunk. In regard to the vehicle, Cleveland County Sheriff Alan Norman stated, quote, The vehicle is right now considered to be a vehicle of interest, and it was occupied two times on the day of her disappearance. It had been discovered by legwork by the Sheriff's Office investigators, along with the federal government, end quote. When asked about progress regarding the case, and whether or not it will be solved, Norman responded, quote, 
It goes to show that this case has actively worked, and will be worked until there is closure for the family and the community. End quote. Despite this new evidence, the vehicle has never been located. 17 years later, the vehicle may have been disposed of, changed hands, or destroyed. Although investigators tried to track vehicles matching those descriptions which were registered at the time, nothing further has come from this tip. So what happened to Aisha Degree? Theories are plentiful in relation to her case and cover a wide variety of possibilities. Some are more extreme than others, and some seem outright ridiculous. But in a case like this, where there's so little information, it's nearly impossible to determine what is logical and what is easily dismissible. The major theories cover most of the following possibilities. Some believe Aisha left of her own accord and chose to never return, or she left of her own accord and was taken by an abductor. Others theorize that Aisha was convinced to leave or had made arrangements to meet someone else and that things went horribly wrong along the way. Some have suggested that Aisha was abducted from her home by someone that she knew, while still others think that perhaps Aisha sleepwalked out of her home that night. There are also theories that Aisha may have been abducted and trafficked, or perhaps she was struck by a vehicle that night and the person chose to hide the body and pretend it never happened. Beginning at the bottom and working our way up, the first theory to approach would be the sleepwalking theory. Sleepwalking isn't uncommon, especially in children. This theory follows the thought process that Aisha got out of her bed, changed her clothes, grabbed her bag, left her home, locked the door behind her, and walked a mile down Highway 18 before being spotted by passers-by. I haven't found any indication as to whether or not they believe she woke up at this point, or if she was still sleepwalking when she ran down into the woods. Either way, followers of this theory think that Aisha was subject to one of a few different possibilities. If indeed she was sleepwalking, at some point, she woke up and was disoriented and confused. Not knowing where she was, she continued on her way, and either became more lost or was discovered by someone who abducted her. A different branch of this theory believes that while sleepwalking, Aisha was struck and killed in a hit-and-run accident. They theorize that this unknown person hit her with his or her vehicle and in a panic took her body and chose to dispose of it in some way that it would never be discovered. It's a thin theory, but it's one of those which, believe it or not, is very prominent on the internet and amongst online detective forums. Police firmly believe that Aisha chose to leave her home that night. They present her backpack as evidence, suggesting that it was packed prior to that morning and that she was preparing to go out on her own. Some people have linked this choice to a book that Aisha was reading at the time. In her fourth grade class at Falston Elementary, they were reading The Whipping Boy by Sid Fleischman. The book involves the two main characters running away, and their so-called adventures are chronicled throughout the book. A common theory is that Aisha, described as an avid reader, was inspired by this book and wanted to go on an adventure. According to this line of thought, Aisha packed her bag and decided that she was going to live the story out, in a manner of speaking. Whether or not Aisha was alone in this, or if she had a friend who was planning to go with her is unknown. Regardless, it is thought that this was Aisha's impetus for running away. Certainly possible, but not very much to go on. According to experts in the field and runaway statistics, it usually takes more than this for a child to choose to go. Most of the time, experts say that it requires the child to be running from something or someone, be it the household, a particular person in their life, or some outside incident which they were a part of or do not wish to be a part of. Many people have factored in the loss of the basketball game the previous Saturday, and how Aisha was upset and blamed herself for the loss. This combined with the book, many believe, is enough in the mind of a nine-year-old to cause her to make the decision to go off on her own. We don't know as of yet, but it's as likely a theory as any other. Could there have been other reasons why Aisha would have chosen to go off on her own? Absolutely. But to this day, investigators are yet to uncover the factors that may have played a role in this. Assuming that Aisha did in fact choose to leave on her own, everything after that becomes suspect. Why would a child who is afraid of dogs and supposedly also afraid of the dark and storms, leave her home somewhere between 2.30 a.m. and 4 a.m. during a storm. We know from descriptions that she was wearing only a long-sleeve white t-shirt, pants, and shoes. She packs her bag with a few items of clothing and some writing utensils, which can only be assumed based on items missing from the home and those which are found at Turner's upholstery shed. 
The walk from her house to Highway 18 is less than a quarter of a mile. This is a walk she's making in a t-shirt when it's windy, raining, and temperatures are somewhere in the 30s. Not knowing what time she leaves, it is known that she was spotted on Highway 18 at approximately 4 or 4.15 a.m. A vehicle pulls over, and based on the driver's statements, he calls out to her asking her if she needs help, and she runs down off the shoulder of the road into the trees. What happened from there is debatable, though it's assumed she entered the shed at some point in time, considering that items of hers were found there. From that point on, it's an absolute mystery. Most people believe that at some point, either while she was at the shed or shortly after leaving it, Aisha is approached by an unknown person or persons and is either coaxed into a vehicle or is taken into one. Police were in the area searching within hours of her last sighting, and had she still been walking, it's not considered possible that she could have walked far enough to avoid detection in that amount of time. Aisha appears to have had the bad luck to have run into someone who either was looking for a child to abduct, or who happened to see her and decided to take her. Either way, Aisha is now with someone else, and is being transported away from home. The chances that she would run into a random child abductor seem to be slim, especially considering how early in the morning it was. The road itself is not very busy during that time, and statistically speaking, that narrows down the chances even more. Into the picture comes Donald Preston Ferguson. In January of 2014, Ferguson is arrested and charged with sexually assaulting and murdering seven-year-old Shalanda Poole, who was found deceased behind the Jones Elementary School in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1990. Ferguson will be found guilty of this horrible crime and sentenced to two life sentences. Ferguson was found through a DNA match after a former suspect was acquitted of having any involvement in the crime. In the case of Shalanda Poole, it turns out that Ferguson knew the victim. He was a friend of the family, and even participated in the search efforts when she vanished. One year after her murder, Ferguson was arrested and pled guilty to sexually assaulting a 10-year-old girl. He was sentenced to eight years in prison and was released in October of 1997. Ferguson was known to be in South Carolina specifically in the Spartanburg area. As a point of reference, Spartanburg, South Carolina is just 38 miles from Shelby, where Aisha vanished. Greensboro, the site of the murder of Shalanda Poole, is 140 miles from Shelby. Ferguson is a special kind of crazy, coming along with family members who were also alleged to be involved in sick crimes such as his. A quick timeline for Ferguson goes as follows. In May of 1989, a 10-year-old is sexually assaulted by Donald Ferguson. He's arrested for this crime by June of that year and bonds out. One year later, in July of 1990, Ferguson rapes and murders 7-year-old Shalanda Poole. In August of 1990, Ferguson's grandmother is shot and killed. In March of 1991, he pleads guilty to the 1989 accusation and is sentenced to 8 years. In October of 1997, Ferguson is released from prison. Within five days of his release, Ferguson and several members of his family are arrested for the murder of his grandmother. In April of 1999, the charges are dropped citing a lack of evidence. In 2007, an investigator examines the pool case and sees a photo of Donald Ferguson, which immediately piques his suspicion. In August of 2008, Ferguson is arrested in Gaffney, South Carolina for failing to register as a sex offender. In November of 2012, he's arrested for defrauding a bank. He's sentenced to a year, but that is chalked up to time served. In January of 2014, he's arrested when advances in DNA match him to the rape and murder of Shalanda Poole. From the period of 1999 to later in the 2000s, there isn't an accounting of Ferguson. He's reported to be involved in drugs, scams, and fraud, and to have been homeless for a period of time. At that particular time, he was known to be a child molester, though he hadn't yet been connected to the murder of Shalanda Poole. Aisha Degree vanishes in February of 2000, not far from Ferguson's old stomping grounds. Not only is she within the age range he appears to be drawn to, but her physical description is very similar to that of Shalanda Poole. Both are young African-American girls with small frames, big smiles, and similar hairstyles. In regard to Ferguson, Sheriff Alan Norman states, quote, The individual was arrested in Spartanburg County, which means in all probability that he had to come through Cleveland County numerous times. 
We're looking back to see where this individual would have been 14 years ago, where he resided, and where he worked. As of this recording, there has been no evidence which links Ferguson to Asia Degree, but for many, he is the prime suspect. The finding of Asia's backpack continues the theory of an abduction. It seems impossible that Asia could have traveled the 26 miles north without being seen, and even if she had done so, there would be no logical reason that she would wrap her backpack in garbage bags and bury it. Some people have theorized that the bag was placed there because it was known that they were going to be building a house, and the responsible person wanted it found. Some have even gone so far as to suggest that the items of Asia's which were found in the shed were also placed by the perpetrator. There doesn't appear to be any hard evidence to confirm either of these theories, but they are out there to be discovered. If indeed a stranger abducted Asia, there are only a few possibilities of what could have happened to her. She was either murdered, trafficked, or kept. Unfortunately, no information exists to support any of these possibilities, and for many, the frustration of this case is how it seems impossible that a nine-year-old could simply vanish into nothing. The final theory, and one of the more popular ones, is that Aisha was not abducted by a stranger, but by someone that she knew. It suggested that Aisha was not only abducted by this person, but was persuaded and brainwashed into it. A family friend, a teacher, a pastor, all have become suspects in the years since her disappearance. Many people believe that someone close to the family managed to get time with Aisha and talked her into running away. It's thought to be possible that the shed was in fact a prearranged meeting place, and that this is why Aisha had taken items out of her bag, because while she was there, she was waiting for someone. The motive behind this is unknown, and how it could have happened is hard to determine. Considering the sheltered life that Aisha lived, it's hard to imagine someone being able to get close enough to do this. There were no computers in the home, so the idea of an internet abduction is unlikely. But Aisha may have gone with someone she knew, someone who either picked her up outside of her home that night, or arranged a meeting. It's thought possible that she was picked up at home, and fled to the shed where she realized that something was happening. Although a possible theory, there are flaws in it. Could Aisha have kept this secret from everyone, including her brother O'Brien, who she was purported to be extremely close with? How would this person have evaded detection after all of these years? Is it possible that this is another situation like the Donald Ferguson case, where the responsible person was actually involved in the search for Aisha in the days after she disappeared? Unfortunately, all of it is possible. Every theory, because there is no evidence to directly contradict any of it. The answers may depend on evidence, and we still don't know exactly what the FBI found on her backpack, if anything. More questions and still less answers. It has been 17 years since Aisha Degree vanished. She would be 26 years old today, and the FBI and Charlie Project have age-progressed photographs of what she may look like today. Her family has moved forward, but never forgotten. Their home is described as a shrine to Aisha, and yes, they still live in the same home and have the same phone number. Her brother, O'Brien, has since had his own daughter, and says she looks so much like Aisha, it's uncanny. Her family have never given up hope that they will see their daughter again. In 2008, they began a scholarship in her name. They also host an annual walk from their home to the last place that she was seen to raise funds to continue the search. To this day, along the lonely stretch of Highway 18 where Aisha was last seen, there is a large billboard depicting her image and asking for answers as to what happened. 17 years later, and we're still waiting for those answers. The disappearance of Aisha Degree is an incredibly frustrating and infuriating case. How a nine-year-old girl could simply disappear without a trace is hard to fathom. It's a very upsetting case, as almost all cases are, but I'm especially sensitive to the ones involving young children. There's something so horrible about imagining an innocent child being abducted that it's almost too monstrous to imagine, and yet we must remain vigilant of it because we don't live in a safe world, and there are sick people out there, like Donald Ferguson. This case has been on my list for a long time. I wasn't originally planning to do it just yet, but Lana Greenland from the Trace Evidence Discussion Group on Facebook suggested it to me, and I decided now would be a good time. I currently live about an hour's drive away from Shelby, North Carolina, where Aisha Degree vanished. 
I've driven on Highway 18 several times, and I'm well aware of just how dark it can get over there at night. This was a really big case when it first happened, and there was a lot of buzz about it. In the years since, people talk about it less, but to this day, if you mention Asia Degree to the locals, they'll know exactly who you're talking about. I feel like this is a case that defies logic in a lot of ways. Most people approach it with what is typical and what is statistically likely, but I don't think this is necessarily the best way to approach this case. There can be anomalies, there can be situations which are completely out of the ordinary and don't fit into preconceived notions and beliefs about what is considered typical. No, nine-year-olds don't typically choose to run away, but some do, and this may be the case with Asia. Investigators are almost certain that Asia packed the bag in the days before and left the house of her own volition. This is completely contrary to what they believe is likely based on past cases and situations like these. I've read a lot about how it's unlikely that Asia could have traveled a mile from her house in the rain, wind, and cold of that night, wearing only a t-shirt, pants, and sneakers, but it appears as if she did. All of the witnesses who saw her that night saw her alone. No one else was around, and no other drivers were on the road. Some things don't fit into a box. Some things happen which are unique or seem to be completely improbable, but they happen nonetheless. I've tried to look at this case from a perspective where nothing can be ruled out and nothing can be known with absolute certainty. If this case were like others, if Aisha's behavior and disappearance were typical, I think it's more likely a resolution would have been found by now. 17 years later, and we still just don't know what happened to Aisha Degree, or why she chose to leave her house that morning. This case has a lot of angles to it, and a lot of moving parts. I think the best way to approach it is to address them chronologically. The weekend before she vanished, Asia and her brother spent their time with their Aunt Alicia. They attended basketball practice on Friday night. Asia and her brother practice, and there doesn't appear to be anything unusual about this day. As we know, Asia was raised in a somewhat of a sheltered environment. Her parents limited the kids to outsiders, and they were mostly around family. The only times they were around other people was when they were at school or at church. From everything I've read, Asia had an active group of friends at school and was close with her basketball teammates. Some people have pointed out that Asia's family didn't have a computer, and that it was unlikely she could have talked to someone on the internet who could have been involved in her disappearance. This is true, but her school likely had computers with internet access. I know that mine did at that time. Cybersecurity wasn't nearly as big of a thing then as it is now. It's hard to say without knowing for sure, but I can't completely rule out the possibility that she talked to someone on the school computers. That being said, we can't rule out her teachers, coaches, friends, parents, or really anyone else who ever came into contact with her. On Saturday night, the kids were brought to their games at a rival school. Aisha played first and fouled out of the game. She was reportedly upset about this and blamed herself for her team's loss. Having played sports as a kid, I know what it feels like when you think you're responsible for the loss of a game. Would that be enough to cause Aisha to take the drastic measure of running off? Well, that's hard to say. Everyone takes things differently. The one piece which makes this seem unlikely is that Aisha's family all say that by the end of her brother's game, which was after hers, she appeared to be over it and doing much better. As the evening came to an end, she was joking and playing with her friends. It seems like an innocuous incident, and one which doesn't require a great deal of analysis. But in cases with so little information that are as baffling as this, people often find it necessary to analyze every detail of everything that happened leading up to it. Sunday seems as though it was a typical day for the family. They attended church, and Aisha's father Harold went to work second shift at his second job, which would have him not coming home until approximately midnight. At some point in the night, the power would go out as the result of a car accident. The time isn't known for sure, but the most likely time is approximately 6 p.m. Harold states that he checked the kids at both 12.30 a.m. and 2.30 a.m. right before he went to bed, and both of them were sound asleep in their beds. Iquilla wakes up sometime between 5.45 and 6 a.m. the next morning. She has to bathe the children before school due to the power outage from the night before and goes about her normal routine. At approximately 6.30, Iquilla goes to O'Brien and Aisha's bedroom and discovers that Aisha is missing. During the next eight minutes, Aquila, O'Brien, and Harold check the house and surrounding areas. Harold calls down the street to his sister's house, where she lives with her mother, and asks if they've seen Aisha that morning, but neither of them have. At this point, Aquila calls her mother in a panic and is instructed to call 911. 
Harold places the call at 6.38 a.m. There's no audio of the call available, but there is a transcript. One piece of information I found in the transcript that I've been unable to find anywhere else. According to the transcript, Harold states, quote, The next-door neighbor said she went down the road and said she'd just seen a kid down the road, end quote. It's strange that this is in the 911 call transcript, but mentioned nowhere else. I don't know if this is something said in panic or if it was a miscommunication. It seems like an important piece of information, and if a neighbor did in fact see Aisha walking down the road, that would have to have happened during the early morning hours when she left the home. It's just an out-of-place detail with no further corroboration. In other accounts, I've read that Aquila heard a car and ran outside to see if Aisha were in it or if the people in it had seen her. There seems to be a lot of confusion in the details around what occurred between the discovery that Aisha was missing and the arrival of the police. Of course, it's entirely possible that this is due to the level of panic everybody was dealing with at the time. Cleveland County Sheriff Dan Crawford calls in the FBI and the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation early in the case. He believes this is going to be a complex search and wants all the help he can get. When asked about this, Crawford tells the media that this isn't about glory or being the one to find her. He doesn't have a problem working with outside divisions. He wants to find Asia by whatever means necessary. The first day of the search is fairly fruitless in terms of anything leading to Asia's whereabouts. They do find a mitten, which Aquila says was not her daughter's. Some people have suggested that this is a strange thing, that Aquila would so quickly dismiss the one possible clue. I don't think it's that odd. We're not dealing with a rich family who have so many items that they wouldn't be able to identify them when found. Most parents are able to recognize their children's clothes, and Aquila is emphatic that the glove is not Aisha's. In the resulting search of the house, police discover that Aisha's backpack is missing, along with several items of clothing. This is when the theory is put together that Aisha packed her bag herself and that her exit from the home was planned. The police believe that in the days leading up to her disappearance, Aisha packed the bag to have it ready to go on the morning of February 14th. For whatever reason, Aisha planned to leave that day. No one has yet been able to determine why. To me, this is a huge piece of the puzzle which is yet to be uncovered. I think if we had an exact answer as to what made her leave, we would have a much better idea of what happened to Aisha. Due to the media coverage, several witnesses come forward who had been driving on the highway that morning. These witnesses give accounts of seeing a girl matching Aisha's description walking south along Highway 18. Police verify the sightings through the descriptions of her clothing. I do find it strange that these witnesses spot a little girl walking along the side of a road at around 4.15 in the morning and don't feel compelled to contact authorities about it. Even the man who was concerned enough to pull to the side of the road doesn't call in and report what he's seen. It isn't until they see the news reports about Aisha's disappearance that they call in and tell what they saw. Their reports, once verified, shift the focus of the search. The spot where Aisha was seen is approximately 1.3 miles from her home, along a lonely stretch of Highway 18. On February 17th, three days after Aisha vanished, the police get their first real lead in Debbie Turner's shed. The items belonging to Aisha are found, in addition to cellophane candy wrappers. Police refocus to search in this area, combing the nearby woods and roads. The police find other candy wrappers matching those at the shed scattered along Highway 18. Despite massive police efforts, a week after Aisha's disappearance, the foot search gets called off. Police continue to investigate, but within the first week they exhaust over 9,000 man-hours and receive over 300 tips. Outside of a few of Aisha's personal effects and some candy wrappers, they have no new leads and no trace of Aisha. Things would remain that way for a year and a half until a contractor stumbled upon Aisha's backpack. It was found double-wrapped in garbage bags, buried 26 miles north of the last place she was seen, in the opposite direction from which she was seen heading. We don't know much about the bag, other than that it's confirmed to have belonged to Aisha. The contractor who found it, Terry Fleming, revealed some details about the items contained within the bag. According to him, there was a paper with Aisha's name on it and a phone number. The bag was taken into FBI custody, and they've never revealed anything about its contents. There are countless reports online that describe clothing and photographs in the backpack, but these are completely unconfirmed. The last piece of evidence to come out regarding Aisha is an eyewitness who claims to have witnessed Aisha being ushered into a car on the morning she vanished. The witness stated that he saw Aisha getting into a dark green car, either a Ford Thunderbird or a Lincoln Mark IV. 
This piece of information was revealed to the public in 2016, and there appears to be some confusion about it. I've read several news articles which claim that this information came in the summer of 2016, after a joint task force of the FBI, North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation, and Cleveland County Sheriff's investigators re-interviewed witnesses and looked at the case with fresh eyes. It said that during that summer, this new tip came in. Allegedly, someone remembered these details 17 years later. This seems unlikely to me, but police believe it enough to publicly issue the statement. On the other hand, I've also heard accounts that this was not new information. Some reports state that this information was in the files from February of 2000, and that it had either been overlooked or dismissed. There's no way of knowing for sure which of these accounts is correct. And although it allowed a glimmer of hope to shine for a moment, nothing has come out of it. At least not yet. There are a lot of theories about what happened to Aisha Degree. Some believe that she was abducted from her home, either by a stranger or someone she knew. Others believe she left of her own choice, but was abducted somewhere along the way. Some believe she sleepwalked out of her home and into the unknown, while others still link her disappearance to a known pedophile and murderer. The first theory I want to examine is the sleepwalking theory. It's hard not to look at the sleepwalking theory as something from completely out of left field, but there is some precedent for it. There have been historical examples of people doing all manner of things while asleep, up to and including murder. I sleepwalked for a period of time in my life, but to the best of my knowledge, I never executed any complex activities while in this state. Mostly, I would get out of bed in the middle of the night and move to a different part of the house where I would lay back down. I have vivid memories of going to sleep at night and waking up the next morning on the couch in the living room or on the floor in the kitchen, but no recollection of moving locations and no reasons for having done it. The theory about Aisha is that, while asleep, she got up from her bed, changed her clothing, packed her bag, and exited the house. I think that all these activities pretty much rule out the idea of sleepwalking. If she had simply walked out of the house, it'd be much more likely. The idea that she would change, pack her bag, and then exit is a bit much to believe. In addition to that, you would have to factor in that she shares a room with her brother, and it's unlikely he wouldn't have heard her or been woken up fully if his sister were changing clothes and packing a bag in the room. He woke up when she went to the bathroom. He heard the springs on her bed squeaking. It seems a stretch to imagine he wouldn't have heard all the racket associated with packing and changing. Sleepwalking is one of those things where it's hard to know exactly how it will work for certain people. Some have pointed out that Aisha had no history of sleepwalking, but I had no history of sleepwalking until I started doing it either. Even if she had managed to do all of this while sleeping, I have to believe that she would have been jarred awake by the time she got outside. It was cold out that night. I've seen estimates as low as 34 degrees Fahrenheit, and based on the witnesses, we know she isn't dressed for this weather. It's raining, and when it's that cold out, the rain is like little icicles dropping on you. It was also extremely windy out. Moving from a warm bed to a wet, windy night would almost certainly disrupt a person enough to wake them up. Allowing a little leverage and assuming that this didn't wake Aisha, she ends up walking down Highway 18 over a mile from her home. Most of the time, sleepwalkers repeat activities and actions that they perform in their waking hours. They don't usually do things or go places that they haven't done before. And although Highway 18 was Aisha's bus route to school, she'd never walked it. This theory then has to make room for her running from the witnesses. So people often say that she must have woken up at this point, gotten scared by the car, and run away out of fear. Certainly possible, but I feel like Aisha would have tried to get to a home or a business, someplace where someone may have been able to call the police or her parents. Maybe she did, and this is the point at which she was grabbed by someone. It's impossible to say, but I do feel like the sleepwalking theory is unlikely. I can't say it's impossible, because in a case like this, we have no idea what exactly happened, and the lack of answers leave a lot of room for theories. Understanding all of that, I would be incredibly shocked if at some point this was proven to be true. It should be noted that this is a completely civilian theory. There have been no statements from law enforcement to suggest or hint that they ever considered this at any point in their investigation. Then we have the idea that Aisha didn't leave her home of her own volition. I think this theory has two different forks to it. There's the idea that someone took her out of the home, and then there's the idea that someone convinced her to leave or tricked her into doing so. 
We know that Aisha was fairly sheltered by her parents and didn't have much access to people outside of her family and those she would be around at school and church. It goes to say that if indeed someone else was involved in this, it was likely someone the family knew. This is typically the case when it comes to abductors and murderers. They often know the victims and have some connection to them. Stranger abduction is more rare, though still a possibility. If someone else were involved in Aisha leaving her home that night, I have to believe it was someone she knew. There were no signs of a struggle, forced entry, or anything out of the ordinary. I think at this point, it's beyond debate that Aisha unlocked that door and walked out herself, locking it behind her. I do not believe that any evidence exists to say that Aisha was taken out against her will. So if Aisha left on her own, that brings up what I consider to be the biggest question in this case. Why did she go? There are a lot of thoughts on the motives behind this. Some people believe that Aisha was running away for some unknown reason. A lot of people point to the loss of the basketball game as upsetting Aisha so much that she chose to go. Others believe that the book The Whipping Boy was inspiration for her to go off on her own adventures. Some have even suggested that something was going on with someone in her life and she was desperate to get away from it. To me, the basketball theory doesn't connect. By all accounts, she was feeling better by the end of the night and she doesn't leave that night. She leaves two nights later. Nine-year-olds tend to be somewhat resilient. While this loss may have upset her, it doesn't make much sense that she would run away, now depriving her team of her once again, if she believes that her fouling out of the game is what caused them to lose. The book could have played a role, children are impressionable, and I certainly read and saw things as a child that made me want to emulate them. I think children are also drawn to their families, and it would be hard to make a choice to leave them behind. From everything I've read, Aisha is close to her brother, and the book involves two people leaving. I think Aisha would have mentioned something to him or to a friend about this and tried to have someone come along with her. I think this leaves the option that she was upset about something else or someone else, and I think that she might have been trying to escape. It's hard to speculate on this without knowing the details, but many people believe that Aisha was either being intimidated or abused by someone inside of her social circle or inside of her own family. It's important to note that the police never listed her parents as suspects, and polygraphs were given to them as part of the procedure. From everything I've come across, to this day their home is described as a shrine to Asia, with pictures of her everywhere, and that doesn't seem like the behavior of parents who are up to something wrong. That doesn't rule out others, though. As we saw in the Shalanda Pool case, Donald Ferguson knew the family. It's entirely possible that someone close to the degree family was responsible for this, and like Ferguson, may have even participated in the search for her. I've read several websites where they state that there's a suspect that knows the family, but I've been unable to find anything that names this person. With so much speculation and fiction around this case, it's hard to know what's true or what's just another made-up detail. To me, if we have a suspect close to the family, I'd have to imagine police would have looked long and hard at this individual and would have named him or her if they had enough to do so. There's also been the theory put forth that somebody just convinced her to leave. I do think this is a likely possibility, as I simply don't believe that Aisha planned out and executed this without input from someone else. Of course, if this is the case, why was she seen walking along the road by herself? Well, that depends on what perspective you take. Some people believe she was walking to a specific location to meet this unidentified person, while others think she may have escaped from this person and was trying to get away. Some theories suggest that the shed on Turner's upholstery property was a prearranged meeting place. The entire theory of someone brainwashing her or convincing her to leave that night doesn't work for me, and I'm going to tell you exactly why. Assuming that someone convinced Aisha to leave and abducted her, what was the motive? I've heard sex trafficking bandied about online, and although that's possible, it's one of those theories that comes up a lot when you're dealing with a missing female. In most cases, Sex trafficking, kidnapping, and abductions are done in circumstances of easy availability. Grabbing someone walking home from school, out late at a bar, alone, an easy target. Aisha fits this description, being by herself at 4am on the side of the road, but how many sex traffickers are operating during those times in mostly empty areas? I think if this is a case of an abduction for sex trafficking, we're dealing with a super high rarity. I can't rule it out, but to this day there's been no evidence to suggest this is the case. Again, as with most of the theories here, it's possible, but it seems less likely than some of the other theories involving a possible abduction. Some people have considered the possibility that Aisha was abducted by someone from the internet, but again, 
her exposure to the internet was limited at best. I don't know exactly what restrictions her school had on fourth graders using the internet, but I don't think she'd have been granted the freedom and leeway to have been on there for long periods of time without supervision. In terms of motive, this leaves only a few. Someone wanted to sexually assault her, someone wanted to murder her, or someone wanted to keep her or give her to someone else. I doubt the latter would be related to a complete stranger, but the first two might. If indeed this were a case of someone planning to abduct Asia and not a spur-of-the-moment crime of opportunity, why would they have planned for it at the time that it occurred? We know for a fact that Asia had a key to her home. She and her brother both did. Their parents worked and when the kids got home from school, they needed to be able to get into their house. I fully believe that if someone else were involved in this, they would have taken any number of opportunities to get Asia. Why choose such an odd hour in the morning? Also. How would a would-be abductor be sure that she would even leave as she agreed to? To me, it makes a lot more sense for someone who knew her and who knew her routine to have arranged to pick her up from her house or to have gotten her in a neighborhood during the day hours when she wasn't around her parents. It's possible that a middle of the night time was chosen because it would buy more time before she would be noticed missing. But how many people would honestly depend on a nine-year-old girl to silently exit their house early in the morning without being noticed? It seems like a hell of a stretch to me. I honestly believe that Asia left her home that night by her own choice, and I don't think it has anything to do with any kind of persuasion or brainwashing. Some theories suggest that since the morning was Valentine's Day, as well as her parents' anniversary, that someone could have tricked her into leaving the house under the guise that they were going to do something special for her parents, but I'm not sure why that would require a packed bag or an early morning exit. There's a well-known blog made by a woman who has been looking into the case for years. The blog is well done and neatly organized. A lot of people are down on it, accusing the writer of putting forth her own theory and trying very hard to debunk all others. When asked about this blog, Aisha's mother said that it was full of misinformation and half-truths, but she believes the creator has good intentions. When the police were asked about it, they said they welcome help and hope that something comes of it. This blog puts forward the idea that Asia was taken by someone she knew, and while I think it's highly possible, I don't think it's the only theory that should be considered. I think it's somewhat foolish to focus entirely on one theory in a situation like this where there is such misinformation and confusion. I used this blog for some of the information that I covered in this case, but I had to triple verify everything because there's a decent amount of information on that blog that is incorrect or slightly slanted. Although I believe the creator has the best of intentions, I think we have a situation like we often see with inexperienced investigators. She decided her theory is correct, and therefore all evidence must fit it, rather than using the evidence to construct the theory itself. I consider this known person theory extremely plausible, but I can't put its value over that of other possible stranger abduction theories. In terms of a stranger abduction, things are a little more complicated. To me, this would follow the idea that Aisha chose to leave her home for reasons unknown, and at some point along the way, an abductor or murderer happened upon her. The odds of this seem so minimal. What are the chances that a person with an inclination for child abduction or murder would just happen to be out around 4 in the morning and stumble upon Aisha? Fairly low, but not impossibly low. She ran into the woods. She spent time at the shed. It's not outside of the realm of possibility to think that any manner of homeless or transient people could have been using that shed for shelter from the storm and either took Aisha with them or convinced her to come along. She obviously wasn't a foolish girl. She ran away when a passerby stopped to ask if she wanted assistance. Would Aisha have had the same reaction if the driver had been a female? That's one aspect of the case I don't think is looked at enough. The possibility that the abductor wasn't a pedophilic male, but possibly a twisted woman. There's no way of knowing for sure, but between Highway 18, the shed, and any place she could have gone after that, any number of people could have come across her and taken her. Later, police would reveal a tip that Aisha had been seen getting into a vehicle that morning. If this is true, I think that puts weight against the idea of a family friend or teacher abducting her. They would surely have checked these people for that kind of car, or someone in the family, school, church, etc., would have recognized it. One piece of evidence that doesn't fit the stranger theory is Aisha's backpack. I have long been perplexed by the manner in which the backpack was found. Double wrapped in garbage bags, and essentially preserved and protected. Some have suggested that this item was placed there to be found, 
that it was the abductor or murderer taunting the family, but I don't believe that. I think wrapping the backpack and protecting it in this way suggests that the person responsible for what happened to Aisha had some kind of a link to her or felt a great amount of guilt for what they had done. I think that a cold-blooded killer or abductor wouldn't have thought twice about disposing of her bag. It could have been dumped in a junkyard, burned, or thrown down one of the many mountainsides in the area. Instead, this person took the bag, gently wrapped it, and buried it in the woods. I don't know what it is about this backpack, but it bothers me. You would think that someone who could be horrible enough to do something to Aisha wouldn't care what happened to her belongings and would simply want to get rid of them where no one could find them, and yet here we have this bag essentially taken care of and preserved. Obviously they thought no one would dig it up, but if you were going to bury it, why wrap it? I think this bag is an important piece of evidence. The FBI has never released it, never explained what they found or didn't find on it. It could have forensic evidence on it, or it could be clean. They have never even said what the contents of the bag were, despite what you might have read online. The fact that the FBI has held onto this bag for 16 years without saying a word about it, to me, means that there is something associated with it that is extremely important to solving this case. Another theory is that convicted rapist, molester, and murderer Donald Ferguson was involved in Aisha's disappearance. We know what he did do to Shalanda Poole though it should be made clear that Ferguson was a friend of the family and had access to her, whereas he has no connection to any family members of Asia Degree, at least that we know of. He was in the area of Spartanburg, South Carolina around the time Asia vanished. Spartanburg is only 30 minutes or so from Shelby. He has a long list of criminal activity, and his terrible crimes related to Shalanda Poole certainly show his proclivity for young African-American girls. He's a sick individual, and he is currently in prison with two life sentences for his crimes. In 2004, the police were digging at the site in South Carolina based on a tip from an inmate. This puts them digging about halfway between Shelby, North Carolina, and Spartanburg, South Carolina. Perhaps Ferguson learned from his experience with Shalanda, whereas her body was left out in the open, and decided to hide Aisha's body. It's completely speculative at this point, but so are all of the theories in this case. The problem is, Ferguson is in jail. They have his prints and his DNA, and if they did find any evidence on Aisha's backpack, it must not have been him, as I'd find it hard to believe police wouldn't have tested him and interrogated him about this by now. He was mentioned by police as being someone to look at after his arrest, but they never said more about it. This leads me to believe that either they don't believe he was involved, or they don't have the evidence to tie him to it. That doesn't mean he isn't responsible, but it does mean that there's no way to prove it. Police often go to people serving life sentences and ask them about their involvement in other crimes. They may even offer a deal for answers that lead them to Aisha's remains. Since he's serving life, they might even offer not to give him additional charges if he helps, or perhaps a prison transfer. But none of this has happened with Ferguson, at least that we know of. If Ferguson is involved, then he managed to commit this crime without leaving evidence behind and without opening his mouth about it over the past 17 years. Although I think he's a sick and twisted criminal, I don't see a lot that points to him playing a role in Aisha's disappearance. Also, I don't think he'd have driven so far north to dispose of her bag. I think he'd have done so in an area he was more familiar with, one where he knew it wouldn't be found, and that would be south and not north. In addition to that, I don't think he would have treated her bag as delicately as it was treated. There is one theory that fits with my belief that the way the bag was treated suggest a connection or guilt, and that's a hit and run. I think it's entirely possible that someone was driving down dark and lonely Highway 18 that morning and accidentally struck Aisha. This person then stepped from his or her vehicle, saw what they had done, and in their panic, picked up Aisha and her bag and drove off with them. Obviously, they would have disposed of the body in some way, shape, or form, and would have done it so well that we have yet to find any signs of Aisha which is ultimately very strange, because we have found her bag. Of course, this was during the construction of a home, and probably a lucky occurrence. That being said, why would you put Aisha somewhere else and not have placed her near her bag? It doesn't make a lot of sense to make two trips to do this. I know this is a very morbid road to go down, but I think it's a thought process that needs to be followed. I think the taking care of and burial of the bag is significant. 
We know it was found 26 miles north of where Aisha was last seen walking. To me, if it were a hit and run, it's entirely possible that this person was heading north, and the reason the bag was buried where it was is because it was along the way. Maybe this person was familiar with the area, and maybe this person even lives in the area. Or perhaps this person lived further north, and that area was just one he or she passed through and knew to be somewhat secluded. It wasn't exactly buried in a way which suggests that it was trying to be hid well. It wasn't far off the side of the road, which to me suggests that the person who buried it was panicked and in a rush. Didn't want to run the risk of the car being parked on the side of the road for too long when someone might pass by and remember it. This kind of thing happens. Just today I was discussing a case with a former law enforcement officer, and he told me about a case of a woman vanishing, and later a man confessed that he hit her with his car and in a panic, disposed of her body. This occurred not too far from where Aisha vanished. It's a tragic event, but not an impossible one. I think this is extremely possible that this is exactly what happened to Aisha Degree. Aisha Degree has been missing since February 14th of 2000. It's been over 17 years since her family last saw her and since the last witness spotted her. It's been 16 years since her backpack was discovered, and the only new tips to come out since that time have been about a vehicle which Aisha may have been seen getting into that night, a tip which has led to nowhere. It's an absolute tragedy when something like this happens, and it haunts the family, the investigators, and anyone close to the victim for the rest of their lives. It's a question that is currently without an answer, and for those who cared for Aisha and tried to find her, there isn't a day they don't think about that little girl and wonder what happened to her. The case of Shalanda Poole was solved 24 years after she was murdered. This goes to show that you never know what could happen and that a case such as Aisha's could one day be resolved. In order for that to happen, someone will have to come forward, or new evidence would have to be discovered that would shine a light on this complete mystery. The case of Aisha Degree is absolutely heartbreaking, and the mystery which surrounds it only adds complex layers to an already enigmatic crime. Aisha's parents still hold out hope that someday they will see their daughter again, but while the heart believes in hope, the mind is often taunted by the harsh reality that after 17 years, there is little chance that Asia is still alive. We can only hope that someday we might find out what happened to that nine-year-old girl, and that justice will be brought swiftly against whoever is responsible for the disappearance of Asia Degree. If you're interested in finding more information about the disappearance of Aisha Degree, there are a lot of websites and a lot of forums you can find. You can discuss it with me and other podcast listeners on Facebook. The Facebook group can be found simply by searching for Trace Evidence Podcast. If you have any information regarding the vanishing of Aisha Degree, please contact the Cleveland County Sheriff's Department or the FBI. What do you believe happened to Aisha Degree? I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Trace Evidence and invite you to check out our website at trace-evidence.com. You can find links to our Patreon, all of our social media accounts, as well as places to download and subscribe to the podcast. I'm super eager to hear your feedback. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a good rating on iTunes and leave us a review. This will greatly help our reach and bring more attention to the cases we cover. Speaking of Patreon, I wanted to do my first monthly shout-out to Trace Evidence Patreon supporters. For the month of July, a very special thank you to Casey Vitales, Tabitha Champion, Emily Reed, Kim Shang, Hey Why the Face, and Mickey, I'm going to butcher your last name, Iktina? Please let me know the proper pronunciation of your last name, and I'll correct it on the next episode. Thanks for listening, and a special thank you to our Patreon supporters. I hope you'll join us next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.